Hey everybody, how are you guys doing? I'm Eric Gerlach, and this is another talk on philosophy, logic, and my favorite of the modern philosophers, Wittgenstein. Now, Wittgenstein's name is hard to say, and in fact, I say it variably because I was not raised German. I was raised German and American, and by that I mean I was raised American. So, with all of that, um, Wittgenstein is how it is supposedly pronounced, with a z, a little bit of a z, 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 z Wittgenstein is how I think and believe it is pronounced, but you will hear me say Wittgenstein and Wittgenstein a little bit because I go back and forth between saying Wittgenstein, Stein, with a bit of a Z, Wittgenstein and Wittgenstein, because I don't say much Wittgenstein, but I waffle a bit on the Z and the Sh and the what have you. Yeah, let's not get into it. So Ludwig Wittgenstein, who lived from 1889 to 1951, is my favorite of the latest greatest philosophers, the greater thinkers of humankind. Now, he and I probably would not have seen eye to eye on everything. However, he happened to push himself through an earlier and a later period of thought that are particularly important to many people that I learned from. I came to Berkeley as an undergrad, I studied philosophy, and then I, uh, after learning a very Wittgensteinian and a later Wittgensteinian perspective from Hans Luga, Barry Stroud, and others at Berkeley, I definitely noticed that some of the top people at Berkeley all think that people don't go far enough in terms of Wittgenstein, though they have their own particular angles on what they think, uh, not necessarily passionately against each other, but they have very different, sometimes slightly different, sometimes very different takes on what it is to push Wittgenstein farther. But I definitely heard multiple times, and then recently when I went back to see a meeting about grad school opportunities, I have definitely been of the impression that those who understand Wittgenstein better than he was able to do frustrated in the end in his final days will be on serious ground to understand the next greatest philosophy and understanding of the human mind. I have always tried to seek out how does the mind work? How does thought work? That's why I call my website Thought Itself. And I really want to study thought and how thought works. What are the chess moves, quote unquote, of human thought is something that I've said a lot. Now, Wittgenstein, I do believe, comes closest to explaining what the chess moves of thought are, but he does so by saying it isn't a simple set of chess moves, and he does so very well, but he does so with simple language and paying attention not just to language, but a lot of how we use language in the world to think, publicly, privately, altogether. Now, these are thoughts that I find very exciting, and I really like to push these thoughts myself into directions I hope help others. So I'm going to take this very carefully, and I'm going to give an intro talk here called Turtles All the Way Around, because I think that it is a good introduction to what I find most revolutionary in Wittgenstein. I'm also going to do a short video about how, from a Wittgensteinian point of view, you don't really have concepts like you think you do. And I'm going to do a short video about Wittgenstein's life before launching into at least a two-part lecture on Wittgenstein's early and later thought. In fact, I will actually be covering his early thought aspects of it with his life, because it is his later thought in which he rejects much in his early thought. He is, as many have argued, consistent with his early thought throughout his thinking in many ways. But he turned against his early thinking, in which he helped uh, Frege and Russell invent formal logic with truth table exercises, and formal logic as it is very much known today, which went on to be remarkably successful with telephone systems, computers, the internet. But Wittgenstein was turning to a more psychological behaviorist approach to how thinking works, and his insights in turning from formal logic I find to be some of the most exciting philosophy there is. I really do like the spirit of Nietzsche best. Uh, as my sister told me from a television show I never watched, spirit of a house cat is that if you have the spirit of Nietzsche, you can hopefully individually do anything, including go off several cliffs and hopefully survive. But what does not kill you makes you stronger, as Nietzsche says. However, Wittgenstein is really the 
multifaceted Swiss Army knife of thinking practically in the situation. And so I really like his thinking, and it is very skeptical. It's oddly existential. Wittgenstein did enjoy Schopenhauer for the modern European class, and Nietzsche. Much, uh, much of his life, he read Schopenhauer approvingly as a younger... Uh, in his teenage years, I believe, and then he read Nietzsche when he was in his 20s or 30s and liked Nietzsche a lot. But he's a very nuts and bolts, let's talk about a table in a room kind of thinker, so his thinking is open-minded, but very practical, which makes it extremely exciting for me because it really is a nuts and bolts psychology that's wise in a rather germanic way whatever that may or may not mean again a group of existentialists is a brood like a murder of crows so let's turn here to the turtles all the way the way around so wittgenstein's thinking can answer many questions about truth and meaning and thinking not completely but more fruitfully can give us fruitful ground for thinking and a better picture although he would have in his later thinking rejected that things are simply a picture, which is a very interesting complimentary thought. Because it's pictures and this and that and models and thoughts arranged, but not just one thought, not just one model, not just one picture, although in his earlier thinking he was trying to present a visual picture of what thought is. And then he turned from that single-minded purpose. So the turn between Wittgenstein's earlier and later thought is much like the Indian metaphor, of turtles supporting the world. It is known in different parts of the world. It is known in India. And the question that arises from such an arrangement. It is a problem known sometimes as the circle and the line by more modern thinkers. Locke, Hume, Russell, and other European philosophers have brought up the Indian debate about what the world sits on such that it is stable and continues, whether or not they use the turtle and Indian metaphor. Some say that the world sits on a turtle, like an animal that symbolizes the cosmos in India and China. I did not know this uh, a while ago, because it is flat on the bottom, like the earth appears, and around on the top, as the heavens appear a dome. And others ask what the turtle sits on, if the world sits on it, and someone once said, famously, it's turtles all the way down. There is actually a joke, I believe it originates in the Anglophonic world in Britain, and that would be from Britain's contact with India and Persia and the Islamic world, is somebody in a lecture says, well, people said the world sits on a turtle, and a woman raises her hand in the crowd in the lecture, the public lecture, to, and says to the academic, well, what does the turtle sit on? And he says, it's turtle, and he gets frustrated and says, it's turtles all the way down. I doubt that was the first uh, fictional person or actual person to say that. So some have called this an infinite regress, is a more mathematical way of saying it. It's an endless series that vanishes over the horizon. In order to know, you have 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 to know, and then it just keeps going. So what are the foundations of logic, thought, the self, the world, how we think, if you need something to prove something to prove something to prove something, and you have an infinite regress? It's an, uh, so Buddha called it an unsolvable problem, in fact. And in a certain sense, it is and it remains unsolved, even if we use a Wittgensteinian or Buddhist similar methods to look past it and solve that as that. Plato called it the greatest difficulty for philosophy, how to solve the infinite regress. And he suggests, hey, hang out with me in my grad school programs. And today, some call it the foundationalism debate, arguing whether or not knowledge or certainty sit on anything known or certain. If your scientific theories rest on assumptions or theories, then it's kind of turtles all the way down, isn't it? Living, wriggling animals. Uh, onward and out of our sight. So philosophy is the love and study of wisdom, truth, meaning, and thought, inclusively. And thought interweaves several elements together in our world. Now, it is very Wittgensteinian, and one of the basic ideas of Wittgenstein, and one of the things that I think he is oddly Buddhist of him, and he did like Schopenhauer, but that doesn't mean that he got this idea. I think Schopenhauer was actually enough of a Kantian that he did not get this idea from Schopenhauer. Rather, his rejection of formal logic eventually brought him to this position. But the Buddha has a concept called codependent arising, which, as I like to joke, sounds about therapists taking over a submarine in a t uh, Tom Clancy novel of sorts in the 80s. I grew up in the 80s, yes? So, with all of that, you have codependent arising is that things always consist of a, an intertangle of several things. Much of what Wittgenstein's thought is doing is saying that 
And at first it can be confusing. What anything is, and I'm very thankful I was talking this out with a friend of mine yesterday, uh, over a beer or three perhaps, I didn't say that though, that as we were sitting and talking about this and talking about what is a thing, from a Vicencinian perspective, anything is several other things together and in a way we don't really logically ever work out. So in a certain sense, the way that mentally, physically our world is to us, it sounds very Heideggerian and it does fit with Heidegger a bit. And Wittgenstein said, he read Heidegger and he says, I understand Heidegger uh, a bit because he's running up against the limits of language. In a strange way, a thing is several things together as another thing, a simple. Other than that, it's very difficult to say what the plan of a thing, any sort of thing would be. In fact, it would be very difficult to say an apple is an organized thing as opposed to several different things like seeds, skins, purposes for apples together, the smell of an apple, the taste of an apple, so in a similar way, uh, we see, we sense, and sensing is not just one thing. When I have an apple in hand, I am seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, and tasting things all together. And while I can particularly focus on the taste, my focus of attention roams around the taste, the feeling, the hand, uh, holding it in my hand. I may not always be conscious of holding it. I may not always be conscious of seeing it. But the interweaving of these together, which are all in a certain sense peripherally there, but your focus is only on one or the other, in a certain sense what Wittgenstein's thought, I believe, is suggesting is that any particular thing, including an apple or your thoughts about the apple, are in a sense several things interwoven together. Like your experience of sensation alone, without even talking about thinking about the apple, just that you have several senses in your conscious perception as you enjoy an apple, and let's say you are either barely or not at all thinking as you enjoy eating the apple, looking at it, smelling it, tasting it, let's not argue there is or isn't thinking there necessarily, but let's say you're having much sensation all interwoven. Now that is sensation, it's already diverse. It's already a plurality. It's not that vision is the basic sense. It's not that touch is the basic sense. It's not that taste is the basic sense. All of it, is the sensation, and any of it could be critically important at any time. It is not that vision is so important that you always go to vision when you're reaching for the apple or you drop it and suddenly you're worried. You often go to vision, but you're interweaving vision with everything else, such that vision is not the basic sense, nor is touch. It would be very, a touch, of course, is a profoundly basic sense. It would be interesting if we always deferred to touch, but then we would not forget we have anything in our hands while we look at something else, or uh, would we? So, and I hold things in my hands all the time. I read online, as I like to joke, somebody says, my uh, three-year-old daughter is crying because she can't find her lunchbox. It's in her other hand, you know, and that is me, unfortunately, as that child still. I hold things and I realize, oh, I've had this in my hand for a while. That couldn't happen if touch was the basic sense. Let's, perhaps, I will float that idea. So, all I am saying is you have many senses. There could be dominant or not senses in this or that situation. We could often use our eyes here or there. But the experience of having an apple in your hand and in your life without even touching on thought, without even thought being a thing we're discussing here, whether or not it exists, is many sensations woven together into the experience you have and it does not have a bedrock sense or an underlying sense that is the constant or need be. We... Imagine you could see the apple, not see the apple while touching it or smell the apple while you were neither touching it or seeing it and experience it as the constant sensation, the object permanence of this apple. I do like the work of Gobnick, the philosophical baby. Uh, it is questionable when we develop object permanence, but we are developing this as we continue on as babies, we can say. From a very early age, possibly even from within the womb, we are we weaving all this together as singular things consciously, becoming aware that they are single things. And again, confusingly, we don't organize our sensations about apples with logic. That would take forever. And be careful about saying with Russell, this is sense data that works like a computer, because the brain is not a train, it's not a tree, and it does not need to be a computer. So you are having all of the, your stomach is not a computer. It does many things. We can feel several things it does. Thankfully, not everything. But you are experiencing a tangle of sensation. So in that, and I have often men, uh, mentioned memory as a f uh, fourth of four elements, I am folding memory and imagination together into things, objects, and object permanence. Because our sensations are all interwoven, 
memory and imagination, which is in a certain sense the same thing, past, present, and future, how I imagine the hallway outside my apartment, or I imagine an apple I will eat someday, that is, in a certain sense, the objects we don't see that we are thinking about on and off and they interweave. I sometimes like to spin around for my students and say, I'm seeing you, I'm, I'm imagining you, now I'm seeing you again. Our memory, our imagination, let's just quickly say here, and there's so much to work out, isn't there here? What things are is not only when it's in your view, it's when it's out of your view and then in your view with memory, imagination, and everything. As such... I do like Avicenna uh, with the logic lectures emphasizes imagination in the Islamic world, and he put very much thinking as image. But this Wittgensteinianism is more powerful and much loved Avicenna. The reason is, is because Avicenna talks as if, like early Wittgenstein, as if vision is the basic element. Vision can play any role it needs to, but it does not need to be the consistent, constant, basic element of thinking. We don't need to use visual imagination always to think. We also don't need to speak or order thinking with speech. Always to think as opposed to always imagine. And here, I've already said enough that you can start to see the picture of Wittgensteinian thinking. What Wittgenstein is explaining, and the way that I like to explain it very simply, is just like sensation. Just like sensation is several things interwoven. In fact, again, I love David Lynch saying, video is, vi is image plus audio. And you're watching and listening to me, possibly, unless you've podcasted this somehow. Just as sensation and you experiencing me at all, whether or not you're thinking or talking to yourself about it or you're listening to my words and that's thought, and I think it could be legitimately said if you're paying attention to my words, that is thinking, passive thinking from a Wittgensteinian point of view, but still thinking. And then when you talk to yourself, interrupting me in your head, that's also thinking, but more active thinking on your part. Thinking itself is any simple things interwoven like this including sensation, and the sensation's already interwoven complexly, isn't it? We don't have time to order all this, do we? No, which is why logical thinking is not an actual thing. The real meat of what Wittgenstein is saying is you do not have ordered concepts or knowledge like a book or a box that is ordered. I do not have an ordered understanding of apples. That has never been a problem for me. I certainly don't have an order understanding of politics, but that's another thing aside. It's just as orders as my concept of apples, which is it isn't. I would be a strange kind of computer program if I had an ordered concept of apples because I would have to think of trees first and then other things in order to think of apples. I do not have to do that. Why? Because just like you do not have to see apples all the time in order to experience them as constant apples, you do not have to constantly be seeing or talking to yourself or listening to somebody else. You do not have to be using words or emotions or perception always a better Wittgensteinian understanding is emotions as motives when we are active. And words are very, very structural to human thought. But one of the things I have noticed as teaching philosophy is more dogmatic kinds of thinking across the world. I like the Hegelese of dogmatism, more objective truth, and skepticism, more subjective truth. More dogmatic, objective thinking in human philosophy, theology, the sciences, all over human history, I would assert, very Hegel style, that this is human thought. So we're talking about the history of human thought. More dogmatic, objective-seeking thought tends to be logo-word-centered. Derrida mentioned logocentrism, but he had a different idea of what this is than the Wittgensteinian idea of what logocentrism is I'm pushing forward. Logical thinking would merely be more wordy thinking. In a weird way, those who like objectivity in human thought tend to say correctly worded thinking is objective and thus logical and rational across human cultures. And more skeptical thinkers tend to go with emotion, tend to go with poetry. Uh, Poe says be both the mathematician, which I do think numbers are number words and a kind of verbal arrangement in intelligence. Spatial, yes, but we can spatially arrange our thinking in words in similar ways. And in time, we arrange words about time. All of this interwoven together, including spatiality, perception, sensation with all of this, more, those who seek objectivity tend to do it in words, in the practices we have of words. There also are those like Nietzsche and Schopenhauer, Wittgenstein was very well familiar with, and Freud as well, who seek the basis of thought in complexes of emotion. The answer here is that there is at least sensation, emotion, and 
logic as far as talking things out. Oddly platonic, but not. Very much more Heraclitus here, and that's the Nietzsche into the Wittgenstein. You at least have a somewhat platonic totem pole, but it's all interactive constantly such that one of them does not have to be the top of the bedrock element at all. As children, we come out, we're in and then out of the womb with objects and emotions, and we are learning that they are our or others' objects or emotions inside or outside of us and all of that, let's say, loosely. And then at age two and three, we start to learn how to speak ourselves rather than merely hear the words as sounds of others. And then we go through practices of reading if we become literate. You could be watching this video without literacy if you are trained in English and yet not know how to write, and you still understand me. So with all of this, the major lesson here is that it's not turtles all the way down, because it's not an infinite regress linearly over the horizon. It's circular and interweaving. If it's a network, it doesn't have a final terminus because it goes around and interacts and switches and pivots as much as it needs to as long as we do, which doesn't go down a certain depth at all. Thus, Wittgenstein's thinking there is no bedrock element, there is no basement level, which is why when people force the talk about is this logical enough, it almost sounds like if we talked more than we felt or saw or perceived, that would somehow be better woven thought. Now, sometimes it can be very more appropriate or less appropriate to talk more or less, and thus reason verbally more so. Although it's very difficult, I would say, and this is why I ask my logic students and why those from the logic class, hello, watching this, understand that the first assignment I gave my logic students is try to think of a thought. I gave them a similar presentation of thinking, and I said try to think of a thought without emotion or not, because I am curious whether there is emotionless or completely sensationalist, uh, sensationalist, sensationless thinking, yes? Because think about how rapidly words interweave with imagination, which is inner perception of sorts, imagination. Uh, Wittgenstein says, what does a clarinet sound like? You would not come up with paragraphs. You would imagine the sound in your head. That is a very instructive example of later Wittgenstein. We are weaving several simple elements together so quickly that people have decided to look at the words alone, but they can't because there are never words alone. There are only words situationally woven together with specific interests in human feelings and purposes and motives, which means you already have objects to deal with, emotions to deal with, and words to deal with. And we could say that human beings have emotive practices, perceptive practices, and verbal practices, but of course those are not exclusive. They are densely interwoven. And there can be practices of speaking words more, but is spoken poetry much more of a logical exercise than formal logic? No. Just because we, well, one could argue poetry is more emotive, but I don't necessarily think so. That is something I think for actually even a lot of this, of course, much of this we simply say, well, there's brain studies, hopefully others will do, psychology others will do. But I actually do think in the ways Buddhists try to observe their thinking through meditation, we quickly have, it, it, well, they try to quiet down all the words in their skull. I once met um, I once met, uh, well, uh, as an undergrad uh, here at Berkeley, I met a young woman who was going silent for months in protest of war, and I was quite impressed with that. She occasionally wrote down on a notepad if she needed to talk to others, and she said she learned a lot when I saw her again and asked her about that. How much of our thinking is words, and then isn't it that we're always sensing either inward or outward with our mind or our senses? And we're always emoting, motivated, and yet, just like you could sit with uh, pain in your back and not notice for hours, I think, and that's how I've hurt my back more than anything active, honestly, I think that we can also not pay attention to our, to many, we fleetingly pay attention to this and that. Like, I believe, I forget the philosopher, but somebody said glancing at others' motives. Uh, we do glance at others' faces and motives, as we argue, even most self-centeredly but we're more primarily interested in our own motives and then convincing the others to just get their motives on board with ours. That is more jerk-like thinking, certainly in practice. All of this is interwoven as social practice of thought, is very Wittgenstein. If you try to pull formal logic out of this, you will thus be completely frustrated. 
But there is something to formal logic. There is something to all of this thinking. It's just once you see this picture, I think it is difficult to say that there is emotionless formal logic as the operations of human thought. So, with all of that, I have, of course, got to ranting, as I usually do. And with all of this, though, some say that thought is logical and rational such that it follows rules or follows rules when it is right or correct in judgment. But you don't need that with this picture because the rules are actually regular situations in which you are participating with mind and body all together. So what we are trying to find either with emotional complexes with psychoanalysis or Nietzsche or Freud as emotions secretly deep down there, feelings we can't feel, or we are trying with more rationalist minded or even other Freudians who think there's verbal lexical complexes. We're trying to find words deep down that are always true or rules, structures of rules. Now we can model the regularities of life. Regularity means rulishness in a fancier way. We can model the regular situations of life with, with words and images, all sorts of things. That does not make our experience of reality at base logical or rule-based because the regularity of Madi, Madi and Bind. Madi and Bind is my new band. And again, we're going to travel with the Traveling Wilbury somewhere. The, yes, basically, in Body and Mind and me trying to talk in the world someday, again, me talk pretty this day, is that you are body and mind in the world and that is why there is no such thing, according to later Wittgenstein, as purely rational thought. Think about how you cannot have talked out thought. If something is logical, it is talked out to some degree, okay? In fact, here, some degree is usually a method of expression. We don't quantize anything here, typically. Why would we? We don't have the time for that. So logical thought just means better debated and better talked out. There are There is no limit to how much anything should be talked out. Gravity hasn't been fully talked out. Now we know the theory completely. Yes, it's going to be gravity a thousand years from now. I don't know that that's true. Much love. And with all of that, it's odd to say we can use the expression logical to mean better worded thought. Uh, but after Wittgenstein's later thought, I think logical merely is a handhold place holding word for better thought often, and it suggests better worded out thought. Well, what if I said, well, you should feel that out better? And I do play on that intentionally. Well, maybe you should feel your thinking out better. Maybe you should sense your thinking out better. Maybe you should look around you. It, all of this is pretty continuously true, right? Maybe you should look at more objects with your senses. Maybe you should talk things out more. These are always true. The problem is, is that people are using the word logical all the time to mean something like rational, when it's very logical to run away from a bear in fear, but that's not because you did or didn't speak several paragraphs to yourself. It merely would, it actually, you would have spoken too much if you spoke any to yourself. So actually it was the logical thing to not logic at all and just run away from the bear in fear. But that's us confusingly talking about how we can't talk about you or you can't talk anymore in that situation. That doesn't mean more thinking or full thinking in words helps. That's, again, not the structural problem here. It is very Wittgenstein not to reduce everything to language use. Many wrongly think that what Wittgenstein is doing is reducing everything to language use. No, he is very much studying language use behavioristically to show how nothing reduces to one thing, not sensation and objects, not emotions and motives, not logic and word use, or even number and mathematical use and practices, which is very much the formal logic uh, issue and algebraic uh, Islamic methods but that all of this together is thinking in any form such that it is very difficult to think of emotional thinking that is not anything else or sensational thought alone or anything like that because we look for in dogs and people any inner combination of elements and that is what we practice and feel in others or sense in others to be thinking. Notice I could say sense in others, feel in others, as well as reason about and talk and say is in others and all of that makes sense so we don't actually fully talk out our talking out things imagine you if if you had to choose your words verbally that would be an infinite regress but because you feel your words fit or not and because there are um, uh, there are objects in the room that do feel they do or don't fit and you feel more or less comfortable around that whole situation 
is basically why you are are not logical in that time. Now, of course, as with everything in the sciences and all of human thought, we could pick everything endlessly apart and figure out when a dragonfly flaps its wings when the hurricane arrives, but we don't need to. This is much like Russell saying, well, now I need to question with a skeptic whether or not I had coffee this morning. No, what I hope this does is it pragmatically opens thought such that we can understand, oh, well, actually asking about more or less rational behavior is rather foolish here, here, and I have to say, I do personally believe that telling people that they don't necessarily need to have certain emotions always, and they don't need to have certain logical rules always, that they should pay more attention to how their words and their motives and emotions and the objects around them interweave as the forms of life they live. And that can actually be quite liberatory in a Buddhistic way, I do believe. I am not a practicing uh, Buddhist or religious person. But as somebody who does care and value about psychology and philosophy and the human mind and how thought works, I do believe that this is oddly Buddhist. It is the best modeling of how human thought works and explanation, talking it out. Again, I could present a visual model more so or not. I am talking it out now and imagining it, and you are also. It's the interweaving of the objects of um, remembered or not, the motives we have that you're sensing and feeling in me or not. And so all of that going around and around and interweaving is the turtles, which means it's not turtles all the way down, it's turtles all the way around. As Nicholas of Cusa and Hegel said about a circle, it is the actual infinite right in front of you. The circle is the horizon. It goes on endlessly. It's just you don't think of a circle as an endless horizon. About the time Piaget says we are about four or five, we're like, ah, it just goes on forever. And we stop... We, Younger children are like, I don't know. Now I have to figure it out. We never figure it out. Older children are like, that's useless. Don't look at that. And that's very Wittgenstein to notice. Much of life is not at all that we fully talk it out. We know what to ignore or not based on the good, bad, tense, and calm in overlapping patterns others feel. And so we know largely, not perfectly, what to ignore in certain situations or not, or include. I dare say it is not about knowing the step in which to numerically or verbally in which to add the eggs and take away the eggshells. It is having the appropriate emotional response at the right time to include and remember the eggs and then to discard the icky eggshells and then give it no more thought once it's in the trash as to what happens to the eggshells because those are to be ignored. Any not ignoring them would feel weird and is not talked out in paragraphs. As Wittgenstein says, if we met a tribe and they said, hey, every night we go to the moon when we sleep in dreams, you would not be able to convince them of anything, but you could convince them to come live with you and then wonder what they will start to think otherwise or not as they live with you and take up your practices because of such an interwoven picture. Now, I do have to say, Alice is frustrated in the very opening of Wonderland because her sister's text is a dry tale that doesn't have any pictures, and it does sound... I like pointing out that Wittgenstein was fascinated by Wonderland in his later years as he did some of his later thinking. And it can be. I did not make a big point of this during my own work on Wonderland. And it is a side note, and I am going to cover the, uh, more thoroughly the connections of Carol and Wittgenstein in very particular talks when I focus on that. But Alice is actually somewhat frustrated because her sister, I have to say, from a psychological point of view, and psychology is becoming a word in Carol's day that a small child is more interested in a bunch of stuff altogether, an adult has more practice in focusing on text and just somewhat imagining if they need to, on paring life down to practices and not asking questions or needing multivalence in order to keep and stay with attention. So in other words, a child, of course, is soaking up all the ways of thought. An adult is more specialized. I have read psychologists say the brain shows us this, that adults' brains are, have more superhighways constructed in them, such that the child is why, 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 Robin Williams said, uh, I don't know, baby Buddha, go ask your mother. And it's the infinite regress, why, 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 all around. Well, if it's wise all around, nothing is known perfectly. I don't know apples or apple seeds perfectly. And it doesn't have to hit a terminus. They just, apples and seeds and trees hang out in my thinking and in the world as they need to. As familiar situations. That don't all need to have a verbal computer program underlying them that make them make total sense. I find that when I tell people they don't need to have certain emotions or certain logical thinking because they are interweaving several elements, it can be quite liberatory. 
And I do believe in that. I think that the Taoists and the Buddhists do say, and there's much Greek philosophy that backs this up as well. And Wittgenstein sadly does not seem too aware of Indian or he is aware of some in, uh, some of India. He liked Tagore, the mystical poet. It definitely seems like slowing down and paying attention to the many things you're doing at once is actually very much what's suggested here. But that is me reading other philosophy into Wittgenstein and suggesting what we could do with it, I must say. So Zhuang Tzu, though, the Taoist, said, once we have the rabbit, we can forget the trap, and then we can involve the trap or not as we like, one could say. He says, I wish uh, the final words of the inner chapters is, uh, where can I find someone who has forgotten words that I can have some words with him or them or her or however many of there are in you, you know. So who has forgotten words? Well, he doesn't say and then has fully forgotten words such that he can't talk or she or them. So actually what the Taoists do suggest, and it is a bit Buddhist, and it is very much the codependent arising of Wittgenstein, although that's the Buddhist name of the concept. Once you realize there are not set emotions or words underneath everything, it leaves you free to understand how a couple things are easily at grabbing people's attention, but there's a couple of important things always in each situation, and you can calmly look at this and that without reaching so much and grasping so much the words or the emotions or fixating only on one element. I do find that to be helpful to people. Now, Wittgenstein enjoyed reading Alice's Adventures to Two Sisters Living in Wales. I was pleasantly surprised to hear. He went to Ireland, Wales, all sorts of places that weren't Cambridge, uh, where he didn't want to be, where he worked on his final thoughts, and he like and he likely heard and felt Carol's deeper meanings. Oh, I don't he doesn't I don't need him to have uh, understood everything I like in Carol. But there is much in Carol about resisting Boole and what would be Frege, which is what Wittgenstein ends up uh, rejecting and uh, pushing against. There's a lot in Carol about multivalence, about the fact that of diversity of examples, uh, rules. Lewis Carroll says many rules could be expressed as the same thing, and the thing could be expressed as uh, many different things could be expressed as the same rule. And he says things like that, say what you mean, mean what you say, but that they're open-ended. And I do think saying is very verbal at words, and meaning is very emotional, is semantics, and is very much meaning. I believe that that actually helps a lot, but it wouldn't simply be that because everything is densely interwoven. So, it is good to use thought, rules, and logic to show others how open-ended thought can be, beyond anyone's particular logic, words, thought, or feelings. I do believe that Wittgenstein appreciated that in the work of Lewis Carroll, and I do believe that he then was inspired partly by Carroll, and that is arguable because there is at least two notes in the philosophical investigation saying, hey, check out Carroll's work here. So he is definitely aware of Carroll and likes Carroll's work enough to read it too. Uh, I would have loved, again, if we can travel back in time in various places because I teach this stuff, I would have loved to have been there to hear uh, Wittgenstein with his accent, uh, Austrian, speak, uh, read in English, Wonderland to two Welsh girls. I would have found that, again, and just to, to see the looks on his face and try to follow his thinking in his mind, like Pose Dupin the detective, would have been fantastic for me. So, the, uh, yes. So, with all of that, um, we have pretty much come to the end of me uh, ranting and raving, um, that we should beware what Wittgenstein calls the lure of the secret seller, the proud idea that we have hit bedrock and completely revealed the truth, rather than revealed yet another strong, important thing or connection between the different interwoven things. It is not that nothing means anything or that things don't mean what they mean. It is that they certainly do and then there's other things going on and we tend to not move our focus of attention around. We tend to fixate on singular elements because unfortunately that can be a problem with our thinking. We can say and just lead onward from there as we can, better or worse. The cure for this proud ignorance, what Heraclitus calls the human disease, pride is a, for Wittgenstein, a rich variety of interwoven examples and elements that continue to show us more and more about the greater whole. Endlessly, which is why it's not a regress, but it is all the way around and keeps going around. Like language. Where does language stop? Where does science stop in any field? 
Beware the lure of the secret cellar. And what Wittgenstein also said, I like using a spider as an example myself in many things. And I liked spiders when I was a kid because they are sort of humble and crawl along and are important for the ecosystem and everything. Wittgenstein said to completely describe verbally any situation we're in and think about how children, adults are in situations all day long that they are thinking about and experiencing, but they could never fully describe in a long Russian novel or otherwise because the root level of our brains is not just verbiage and paragraphs in any order. That to fully describe any situation you've ever lived would be like trying to repair a torn spider's web with your fingers. It would be impossible. I cannot describe to you in words fully the meaning I mean with this sentence. Why? Because nobody's ever fully put anything in words, including what I'm doing right now. This can influence other situations. We don't put this or ancient Sumer or the Greeks or anybody else fully into words. This is also why I think it is very foolish to say the Greeks or Sumerians, or any civilization, was a rational, logical civilization. What civilization wasn't and which were based on words? The Mayans, the Greeks, the Sumerians? What's a logical Western civilization? I, you know, I've been a white guy for a couple weeks now. I don't know what being a logical person is. And I've always explained that to people. I have several generations of my family who have been scientists. Apparently, I learned late in life, my great-grandfather worked for GM, building parts of cars and engines and tanks. And then you got with all of that. He uh, apparently was good enough of a parent. He drove my grandfather to be a psychiatrist and a uh, psychoanalyst. So all that worked well. And then he moved more into gestalt theory after psychoanalysis turned out to be kind of wonky out in the West Coast. So gestalt theory, uh, that several things are interwoven together as the whole picture, is very Wittgenstein. And I do not know how much Pearls was influenced. I do believe that Pearls was somewhat aware of Wittgenstein and somewhat influenced, but I won't make that hard claim right here. But an open-ended psychology philosophy about simples interwoven together and that we all have similar minds, otherwise we could not communicate at all, I do think undoes the modern mythology of logical and illogical civilizations. It's simply, there is no quantitative limit of how much things are talked out or are just felt and concealed that we call a tribe or a walled civilization. I don't know what that is. So with all of that, that is my turtles all the way around talk. So thank you for that. That is my overall message of what I find to be most revolutionary, truly Copernican in Wittgenstein. And I was taught by people at Berkeley, and Berkeley is not to be shaken an entire stick at uh, as far as math, philosophy, logic. I was taught by fine people that there is more here that others do not understand. And in my years of teaching, that is the best overall summary of what I find most revolutionary that others have trouble finding still. And here I mean, unfortunately, I am of the opinion many professional Wittgensteinians, I will not name names. I don't have many names to name, honestly. But I do know then and now still, there are many still trying to hold out against Wittgenstein thinking there's a more logical approach here. I hope I have convincingly argued there can't be. But that has nothing to do whether we should or shouldn't use more words right now, after I'm done talking. So much love, much happiness. And as usual, I will follow with other lectures. These will be on Wittgenstein, point by point. And I will see you if I ever do see you. <laughs>